In 20th century segregated America, big cities often had a main stem where black businesses and entertainment venues clustered along a street that ran through the heart of the African-American community. In Indianapolis, the crossroads capital of the heartland, that street was Indiana Avenue, a town unto itself, a place that became a destination in the early 1900s for blacks during the Great Migration from the South. During the 1930s and 40s, over a dozen jazz clubs stretched from one end of Indiana Avenue to the other. Its soundtrack would be the music that spilled out into the streets on summer nights in the days before air conditioning, the doors propped open, the avenue alive with musical moments that would echo throughout the jazz scene. Freddie Hubbard and West Montgomery sitting in with Sunrot, the Senate Avenue YMCA. Cannonball Adderley stretched out ecstatically in his chair at the smoky after-hours missile room. Eyes closed while he listened to Montgomery's blues-buttered octaves for the first time. Pookie Johnson and Buddy Parker throwing down on saxophone with bebop legends Dexter Gordon and Wardell Gray at a post-gig jam session. David Baker's progressive bop band holding court at the Topper on 34th Street before going on to form the nucleus of the revolutionary George Russell sextet. These were the places where Indianapolis musicians learned to survive and thrive, when jazz education took place in the clubs and an all-night musical joust known as Cutting Contest, in which players tried endlessly to top each other's riffs and licks. They jammed freely with the big names that came through town, the likes of Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Charlie Parker, and often bested them. As David Baker recalls, any out-of-town musician that walked into those after-hours sessions did so with trepidation. There were no secrets in the jazz world, Everybody knew who these cats were. One of the most prominent jazz musicians to emerge from the Indiana Avenue scene was trombonist J.J. Johnson. Johnson left Indianapolis at an early age, becoming a fixture on New York City's revolutionary 1940s bebop scene, playing with such greats as Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis. To many, J.J. Johnson practically reinvented the trombone as a jazz instrument, introducing what historian Ira Gittler calls a swift, extremely legato eighth note style. If there was a ground zero for this explosion of Indianapolis jazz that reached across three decades, it was Crispus Attucks High School, founded in 1927 as a means of diverting black students from other Indianapolis schools. Attucks became a haven of African-American scholarship and achievement, with legendary music teachers such as Russell W. Brown, Norman Merrifield, and Laverne Newsom tutoring students like Baker, J.J. Johnson, Montgomery, the Hampton family, and countless others. Outside the nurturing confines of Attucks, the students went where there was opportunity, and the opportunity was jazz. For some, it was formal instruction at Ruth MacArthur's conservatory down on the avenue. For others, like the Montgomery Brothers, it was the self-taught classrooms of the 1950s club scene. Most nights, West Montgomery could be found at the Missile Room across the street from the Madam Walker Theater. It was on one such evening in 1959 when saxophonist Cannibal Adderley dropped by after a gig at the Indiana Theater. Adderley was so excited by Montgomery's performance that he tried to call Riverside Records producer Oren Keepnews at 3 in the morning. On his next trip to New York City, Adderley persuaded Keepnews to come out to Indianapolis and hear Montgomery. Keep News did so and offered Montgomery a contract on the spot and produced more than a dozen of his albums over the next four years. The recording showcased Montgomery's revolutionary notes to octaves way of constructing a solo. Though Montgomery's family stayed in Indianapolis, he spent much of the 1960s on the road. Other prominent musicians such as Freddie Hubbard and Larry Ridley went to New York. Indianapolis lacked two key elements for a regional scene to hold on to its players, record companies and concert promoters. Socioeconomic and political changes were at work as well. Integration was taking hold. Indiana Avenue was no longer the enforced town within a town. And then there was the specter of urban renewal and in Interstate 65. The highway and the expansion of IUPUI cut away and destroyed significant African-American neighborhoods. Homes, schools, businesses, and churches crumbled under bulldozers. A community and a way of life that nurtured the development of so many gifted artists disappeared in a matter of years. The Madam Walker Theater alone still stands today. As Indianapolis poet and educator Mary Evans wrote in her essay, Ethos and Creativity, to understand the enormity of what transpired, one would have to have been there, somewhere in the beginning, during that time when hope boogalooed, time-stepped and literally ran wild down the avenue, and throughout the flurry of neighborhoods that comprised the city's black community. 
What I remember about the avenue was a sense of possibility, and then I remember wrecking balls wiping out houses. But the avenue's musical heritage has been increasingly acknowledged, celebrated, and remembered in recent times. We still have their words, as well as their music, to bring to life the lost world of another time, when a community brought together by racial oppression found a way to persevere, overcome, and work to build a prosperity of the heart. <laughs>